So I'm going to be uh, zooming out and talking about an even longer uh, time frame of paleogeography. We're going to be uh, give a fair amount of details about a specific paleomagnetic pole from right uh, from the Superior Province right after the time that Laurentia assembled, Laurentia being the Cratonic interior of North America. And in particular, I want to think about some large-scale questions um, related to the paleomagnetic record of mobile lid plate, plate tectonics. This is a summary of a number of suggested onset times of mobile lid plate tectonics as compiled in Koronaga. You're looking from the Hadean to the present. Now you can see there's a lot of different onset times here in the Ar Archean based on a number of different types of evidence, but there are some young outliers. Um, and these young outliers continue to be discussed, particularly because they're being pushed by their proponents. Um, such as this is the December cover of GSA Today, uh, in which Bob Stern argues for uh, the majority of the Proterozoic being a single lid, that is a stagnant lid, um, and that that was predating modern mobile lid plate tectonics. In this article, uh, Stern asserts that the paleomagnetic record is equivocal as to whether there is uh, mobile lid plate tectonics uh, prior to the Neoproterozoic. And I want to convince you that the record, uh, both the geologic record and certainly the paleomagnetic record, is in no way equivocal in this regard, uh, and that there was mobile lid plate tectonics, um, at least from 2.2 billion years to the present, um, which can be well illustrated actually taking Laurentia, that is North America's record, uh, alone. In addition, and this feeds into the arguments that Stern was making in that piece, there have been numerous interpretations of episodic proterozoic stagnant lid regimes, the idea that Earth could go in and out of a mobile lid and a stagnant lid, and there's been in particular assertions that big parts of the proterozoic may be in a stagnant lid regime. Uh, and this was what was being uh, leveraged in, in this, this article. So I've been in, engaged in an effort to write a review on the paleogeographic uh, record of, La of Laurentia for a forthcoming book on ancient, ancient supercontinents. Um, and it's been using a compilation of paleomagnetic poles. It's been curated through a series of Nordic paleogeography workshops. Those are being shown here in the, in the, colored, in the colored dots. Uh, I've indicated for reference the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, um, where we had hoped to uh, convene in person. Of course, we're distributed across the globe right now. So what I want to highlight in this map of Laurentia are these light gray uh, units, which are the Archean provinces of Laurentia. And these assembled to become Laurentia and were sutured by the Trans-Hudson origin. Um, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, um, forming Laurentia around 1.8 billion years ago. This uh, pink and peach color are zones of subsequent growth of Laurentia through the Proterozoic, through processes like arc continent collision. So the Trans-Hudson origin is this major event in the assembly of Laurentia. And it resulted from the collision of the superior province on the lower plate and uh, amalgamation of Archean provinces uh, together as the upper plate of known as the Churchill plate. Now, in this uh, article by Wheeler, uh, they drew uh, analog here, as we can see in this map, showing that the scale of the Trans-Hudson origin is very similar to the scale of the Himalayan origin. Um, in addition, they show, um, particularly through documenting and dating eclogites, a similar style of continent-continent collision, arguing that the Trans-Hudson origin is an example of modern style plate tectonics in which you have continent-continent collision and some degree of continental subduction. Okay, so are the paleomagnetic data consistent with this 
uh, geologic evidence that the Trans-Hudson origin um, sutured uh, Laurentia together around 1.8 billion years ago. That would predict that we should see paleomagnetic poles giving a consistent direction between the different elements of Laurentia. And here's to highlight data from the margin of the slave province and from within the Trans-Hudson origin poles uh, in the time just post-dating this 1.8 Trans-Hudson origin. Um, that shows some consistency. But there has been a real lack of data that can evaluate this, this question from the Superior Province. And we're going to go to where this red star is uh, in the East Central Minnesota Batholith to develop more constraints on this question. Now, these rocks come from the, the Pinocchian origin. And at the same time that there is this continent-continent collision as Laurentia uh, amalgamated with the Superior Province and Churchill collision, there was an arc continent collision going on in the Pinocchian origin. Here's a tectonic model by Schultz and Cannon uh, showing this period of arc formation, arc accretion, fold and thrust belt deformation, and then the emplacement of post-tectonic intrusions. These are going to be the intrusions that we'll focus on in developing new constraints. You can see, uh, to get at the question of whether there was mobile lid plate tectonics, that certainly in this interpretation of the origin, which I think is a very nice synthesis of the data by Schultz and Cannon, that there certainly seems to be evidence of arc formation and arc continent collision requiring mobile lid plate tectonics. OK, so let's zoom in here. This is a geologic map of the Precambrian basement of Minnesota. And we're going to be focused in here on these post-Pinocchian origin intrusions, which are shown in this red color, of the east central Minnesota batholith. So this is a major amount of uh, uh, a big upper crustal batholith um, comprised both a felsic and, and mafic melt that was in place uh, following, following the origin. Um, one thing to note, which is useful for us in developing constraints here, is the Spirit Lake tectonic zone to the south is the zone where there was subsequent deformation of Laurentia in the time that followed. Uh, which shows that these origins really stabilized the, the craton, which is useful in these post-tectonic intrusions really being post-tectonic and being minimally modified in the time since emplacement. So this is a project that's been tackled by a number of people in uh, my group here at Berkeley, including uh, Maggie, Maggie Avery uh, during her uh, postdoctoral post research. Um, she also developed some paleo intensity uh, data, data from these dikes. They're still in development. Uh, Yuming Zhang's been working on these, these, dikes, these dikes as well, both in the field and the lab. And I'm going to present some new geochronology data uh, developed by Blake Hodgkin, who's a post postdoc here in my group. Here's our first look at our main target, which are these diabase, diabase dikes um, that are typically relatively thin. You can see this one's about a meter and a half across. And here it's intruding this nice pink granite. In terms of the geochronology, these are new uranium lead zircon dates um, that are coming from the granites. The dike, these mafic dikes pervasively intrude the St. Cloud granite. They are uh, in the same orientation and appear to be co-magmatic with these quartz porphyry dikes stated here, and they're absent in this younger and cross-cutting Richmond granite. So this gives a really tight age constraint on the age of these dikes that are about 1780 million years old. Another nice thing about the East Central Minnesota batholith is that there is uh, abundant thermochronology data, and we've developed some more as well. Here's a summary. Here we're looking on this timeline. These are these uranium lead zircon crystallization ages. And we can see that we get the same ages from uranium lead apatite and argon argon horn blend, which are relatively high temperature thermochronometers, that they give the same age as the uranium lead zircon crystallization ages uh, is consistent with magnetite remnants blocking at the time of emplacement. We can see that argon argon biotite 
Mages are slightly younger, so there is some exhumation after emplacement, um, but are not much, much younger. And these also indicate that these have not been disturbed by tectonomagmatic events uh, anytime subsequently in the subsequent 1.7 billion years. So a fun thing about presenting at the magic workshop is I know that there will be uh, more of you in the audience who are fluent with in interpreting uh, demagnetization data. So here we're seeing paleomagnetic data. Um, this is from specimens from the same, uh, the same sample, one being demagnetized using AF demagnetization and the other through thermal demagnetization. We can see three components of minor viscous present local field overprint, um, a steep south remnants, which we can see here in the thermal unblocking spectra is consistent with low titanium magnetite, and a shallower west component that in the thermal data can be seen to unblock at temperatures characteristic of monoclinic puritite, and we can see coming off here at higher coercivities than this steep magnetite remnants. So there's variable behavior in some dikes where they're completely dominated by this magnetite remnants. In others where there's a more appreciable uh, high coercivity uh, pyrotite component. Um, here is some data we've actually seen in this session. This is the third talk to show some low temperature magnetometry data. Um, these data that I'm showing here were developed on a visiting fellowship at the Institute for Rock Magnetism, where there are beautifully maintained uh, MPMS systems from which these data can be, can be developed. Um, here in this experiment, a large pulse of a magnetization is acquired at 10 degrees Kelvin. And then we're warmed and see a big drop of remnants uh, across the Verway transition, indicating, as we inferred from the thermal demagnetization spectra, uh, the presence of low, low titanium magnetite. One thing that we see in these data, if we look where there's some of this high coercivity component, um, is that we see a degradation of the magnetite signal. And we start to see expression of the Besnez transition, held, indicating the presence of monoclinic puritite. In samples where there's much more of this puritite remnants, we see a much stronger expression of the Besnez transition. However, the remnants is dominated in these dikes by the steep south magnetite remnants, which we are generally able to really nicely separate off from the uh, subsequent puritite component, um, which gives us magnetite site mean directions from 23 dikes that are being shown here. Now, of course, it's nice to have paleomagnetic field tests. Here are the dikes that I've been showing data from are these east-northeast trending dikes, such as this gray that's shown here. Here, this is cross-cut by a northwest trending dike. Here we see uh, thermal uh, demagnetization of that dike giving a direction. Interestingly, this direction is very similar to that of the high coercivity remnants or that remnants that's held by puritite, indicating that this was associated with some hydrothermal activity. Um, but here we can conduct a bait contact test on this northeast trending dike. So here, if we look right next to uh, this dike, this red component is that same direction that we just saw here in the cross-cutting dike. If we go further away, here's three meters away, we can see evidence of that uh, thermal overprint, but now we're isolating this steep primary direction as well. And if we go here around seven, seven meters away, uh, we are no longer, are the thermal overprint from this cross-cutting dike is negligible. So there's a positive bait contact test. This dike cross-cutting is about 1.1 billion years old. So this provides a, a use, useful field test, um, which increases our confidence in this uh, magnetite mean we're getting from these dikes. One thing that I just, that I find is often poorly documented in the literature when people are developing paleomagnetic data from dikes is often they're not tilt corrected, but often it's not the data for why no tilt correction is being applied is not elucidated. I think it's important for us to document this, so I'm doing this here. Here's two, uh, two field photos of these vertical, vertical dikes. Here one that's about two meters thick, really nicely exposed in this quarry. Here's another one around 20 centimeters thick. And here are uh, 
orientations of, of these dikes. And here the Fisher mean of the poles to these dikes is shown. And you can see that this uncertainty on that mean cross cuts the equator, which means these dike orientations are indistinguishable from vertical. And we use that to interpret that there's been very little tilting during exhumation um, of, of, the, of the batholith and these dikes. So that gives us some confidence in taking these uh, magnetite site mean directions, converting them to virtual geomagnetic poles, and calculating a mean paleomagnetic pole uh, for the margin of the superior province uh, 1.78 1, 1. billion years ago. OK, so that brings us back to being able to look at this question of consistency between the amalgamated provinces of Laurentia. Here we have data from the margin of the slave province, which had consistency with this data from a pluton within the trans-Hudson origin. And we can see a very similar position shown here in blue of this new pole we've developed from the superior province. So these paleomagnetic poles are consistent with an assembled Laurentia following the trans-Hudson origin. This isn't surprising. This is what we would expect from the suturing of these provinces together in this major continent-continent collision. Um, but it's a nice paleomagnetic test. And one of the things that um, is nice about this is it actually gives us confidence, um, as I'll illustrate in the next uh, few slides, of how differential pole positions um, from the superior province and these other provinces to the north in older times are the result of differential positions, both paleo latitude and orientations between the respective provinces. So here, I just want to remind, uh, remind you all, particularly those who don't spend a lot of time using paleomagnetic data for the generation of paleomagnetic reconstructions that paleomagnetic poles constrain paleo latitude and orientation. So here is a, a outline of Laurentia. This is actually outlined further into the Proterozoic. We can see the Great Lakes region here, Hudson Bay. Here's the new pole right here. And I'm going to show this an uh, animation here. Oh, I'm going to show an animation where we take that pole and we put it to north. And in the process of doing so, we're constraining the paleo latitude of the craton, and we're also constraining its orientation. Now, of course, we could spin about that pole at the north to different paleo longitudes that aren't constrained, but both the paleo latitude and the orientation of Laurentia are being constrained by this pole. So here to do that with our uh, provinces on either side of the trans-Hudson origin, showing the superior province here in brown, um, and the Hearn plus Ray plus Slave provinces, which collided with it in the trans-Hudson origin uh, in, these, in these blues and greens. And here you can see that this paleomagnetic pole, as well as those other ones indicating the same position, uh, reconstruct Laurentia to moderately high latitudes and in a sort of upside down position to today. But what's great is that the paleomagnetic record from the superior and slave provinces, so here this green blue and the brown, necessitates differential plate motion from 2.23 to 1.85 billion years ago. And there's a real nice, nice series of data uh, coming from uh, the, the slave province and the superior province that illustrates this, that in contrast to the picture where we see here, where the poles are consistent with one another, they indicate different paleo latitudes and orientations. So I'm going to illustrate that in a series of snapshots here. So here we're looking uh, at 2.2 billion years ago. And we can see that we have time matched poles from these Archean provinces, which indicate disparate latitudes and orientations. That is also true 2.1 billion years ago, around 2 billion years ago. And then here, the ocean domain that existed between these prior to the collision in the trans-Hudson origin is known as the Manakiwan Ocean. And we can see that progressively closing here. You can do this differently. You could have it more as a sort of pivot type closure. Here we're showing a wide orthogonal type closure between the two as the lower plate approaches the upper plate, 
and then colliding in the Trans Hudson origin to make an assembled Laurentia here at the time period of this new pole that we've developed. So here, what I'm illustrating is a timeline summarizing uh, major orogenic events in Laurentia over the past 1.8 billion years. This trans-Hudson origin is hypothesized to be associated with the assembly of the supercontinent Nuna, of which Laurentia and other cratons such as Baltica are a major component. Following this, there are multiple episodes of accretionary orogenesis, which led to the subsequent growth of Laurentia down into the sort of Southeast, actually making much of what is underlies the United States. And there's a rich paleomagnetic database um, from Laurentia throughout this time. So here is these moderately high latitudes that we are just looking at. This is reconstructing a single point on Laurentia, uh, in this case, the city of Duluth. Um, and we can look at, here's reconstructing these, these polygons of, of Laurentia through time. We can see Laurentia is growing here uh, through these, uh, these long-lived active margin leading to episodic cretionary orogenesis. Um, and Laurentia returns to high latitudes, though in a different orientation, um, about 1.1 billion years ago. Uh, some of you may know this is a period of the record that I have uh, sort of obsessively worked on for, for some time, um, as there's a really rich record in the mid-continent rift uh, leading up to the Grenvillian origin. But this is another important time period where we have a rich record that tells us about uh, mobile lid plate tectonics being operating at this time. So here we have Laurentia at high latitudes um, at 1140 million years ago. There's then a swath of paleomagnetic poles known as the Hewinawan track. And there's a method that I'm excited about that I, that I talked about at our last uh, magic workshop and we subsequently published of doing a paleomagnetic Euler pole inversion. This is a method that was pioneered in the, in the 1980s by Richard Gordon. One of the things we're doing here is putting it within a Bayesian framework allowing for uncertainty to incorporate age uncertainty in the poles, which is often hard to incorporate in pole syntheses. Uh, an interesting thing about doing it with this track is it requires that you have small circle motion um, associated with, uh, as you'd expect with plate tectonics. And also that this rapid motion illustrated here, if we take this pole path um, with Laurentia going from high latitudes to low latitudes leads up to the next major continent-continent collision in Laurentia's history, that of the Grenvillian orogeny, which sutured continents together in the supercontinent Rodinia. So here, there we had these protracted interval of accretionary orogenesis on the southeast margin of Laurentia, leading up to rapid plate motion and continent-continent collision of the Grenvillian orogeny, leading to the supercontinent Rodinia. There's interesting parallels here, and you can sort of see it illustrated in these colors. If we think of the margin leading up to the assembly of Pangaea, there being episodes of arc continent collision, of collisional microcontinent accretion, and then the continent continent collision of the Allegheny and Rajni and the assembly of, of Pangaea. So here, just in this summary of the geologic record, we see real parallels in terms of the or, or a genic history interpreted from the geology consistent with mobile lid plate tectonics. So I'd argue that the paleomagnetic data, as well as the geologic record of Laurentia requires mobile lid plate tectonics from 2.2 billion years old onward. Of course, you could do more of a global synthesis. I've had a very Laurentia centric uh, interpretation here for the sake of it being something tractable length of this talk. But I think based on the Laurentian record alone, uh, we can rule out these interpretations of stagnant lid regimes and late onset of mobile lid plate tectonics. Another aspect that I think is useful for us to be thinking about when these arguments surface, and they will continue to resurface in the geodynamic uh, literature, and there's a point um, that uh, came up uh, in conversations with uh, Bruce 
Bruce Buffett, my colleague here at, here at Berkeley, um, is Bruce made the argument that in a stagnant lid regime, there should not be sufficient heat flow across the core mantle boundary to sustain a geodynamo on Earth, that values are likely need to be um, at or above adiab adiabatic heat flow, around 15 terawatts, and that heat flux in the stagnant lid, as say was modeled in this O'Neill uh, paper, um, decreases to a level that's too low to generate a field. Even calling on other energy sources, those often require cooling to some, some extent. So in some ways, we could take evidence of a geomagnetic field as evidence for mobile lid plate tectonics. Now, of course, many of you that are, that are here today have put a lot of work into the paleo intensity database. Um, here's the compilation recently published by Richard Bono and, and colleagues looking particularly at the history of the Archean and Proterozoic field um, and showing that for many times in the Proterozoic, we have a modern or near modern field, of course, with this very interesting observation of uh, a very weak uh, late, late Ediacaran field. Though one aspect of this record, and we know that it can be, it's difficult to develop high quality paleo intensity estimates for a host of reasons, there are big gaps here, right? Um, where someone could say, hey, there could be a stagnant lid in here. One thing I'll argue is that from the paleomagnetic pole database, if we have a positive baked contact test, if we have consistent magnetization across an igneous province that's leading to a high quality paleomagnetic pole, um, even if we can't develop a high quality uh, paleo intensity estimate because of non-ideal behavior or some alteration during the experiment, this in its, of itself is evidence for an appreciable geomagnetic field. Um, so here is our paleomagnetic poles with positive bait contact tests. So these being uh, shown here for Laurentia and these orange dots and all other cratons in the database of curated high quality paleomagnetic poles in blue. And you see here, if we do it this way, it's much harder to sort of find a gap in the Proterozoic where you could argue that there was not an appreciable geomagnetic field. So in conclusion, um, the geologic and paleomagnetic records of Laurentia require mobile lid plate tectonics from 2.2 billion years ago to present. We see this through the geologic records of large scale collisional orogenesis orogenesis, episodic accretionary orogenesis, and these paired sets of poles um, from the constituent parts of Laurentia are really strong evidence of differential motion between them leading up to the collisional orogenesis of the trans-Hudson orogeny. So is the rapid plate motion leading up to uh, Granvillian orogenesis when Rodinia assembled? And perhaps we can take this evidence of a persistent geomagnetic field um, given these heat flow arguments uh, to also argue against prolonged stagnant lid regimes. Looks like I have one, one minute left and I just wanna do a quick workflow appendix before I take questions, given that we're here at the magic, uh, magic workshop. Um, there are YouTube videos that show tutorials. Um, the workflow we apply in, uh, in, in my lab is to once we develop data, um, it's it's in a format that is consistent across these rapid rapid magnetometers, uh, the CIT format. But we take that data and we import it into Magic format using uh, PMag PMag GUI. Um, so that can be done here. PMag GUI can be downloaded as an executable program. There are of course other ways to do this conversion to Magic. But one of the really nice things about doing it using this PMag GUI tool is we convert it to Magic format before we do our data analysis, which means that our interpretations are also inherently in uh, magic format. So we'll analyze in, in DMAG, DMAG GUI. So here's a view of one of, the, one of these dikes where we've done, where we've done our fit, fits to the data. Here we're seeing this at the specimen level. Here's the summary of the data for the site of this mid-coercivity uh, magnetite component. And then once we've uh, saved our interpretations, we can create a magic text file for upload. Um, and there's been tools that have been built out. Not all the necessary metadata comes with the data we develop, um, or the data format that comes out of our lab. So for example, we need to then subsequently insert things like geologic types and classes that are required metadata. But there are tools to help do that and with the uh, implement the controlled 
vocabulary. And this allows us to also validate the magic contribution before we put it up on the website. And then one, one last thing um, is that we then, uh, that file that's been generated in uh, Pima GUI can then be uploaded to magic. Now, of course, you could do this using uh, other, um, other, other software. But a nice thing I want to point out that you can do with the magic database that's been uh, developed is that you can make a private contribution. So the data that I've shown, we haven't, we haven't published it yet, currently working on the manuscript, but I just um, uploaded the contribution to magic. So here it is in my private, private workspace. Um, but in addition to having it in my private workspace, you can see what my future DOI will be. I can share this contribution. And when I do that, it gives me a, a, private, a private link. And that means that I can make it available to reviewers. Um, and doing this, making our data available um, down to this measurement level is required by AGU data policy, um, such that when something goes out from uh, for peer review, the AGU editor should be implementing this policy of making it so the data are available for, for the reviewers. And this provides, there are multiple ways to do this, but this provides a way to do this. So I've inserted this link um, into my manuscript that will go out to um, re reviewers. Um, and when they click on it, they'll get this private key that will bring them to the contribution here um, and the ability to download all these measurement level data. So there are some tutorial videos that we put together um, last, last March um, that can help provide some additional guidance on um, both just the magic database in general and making contributions. And also if you're interested uh, in the workflow that I just uh, tried to briefly illuminate on using that workflow as well. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. I just uh, a quick uh, emphasis, uh, Nick, um, that uh, if you uh, run into problems with uh, like at AGU or journals uh, uh, saying that uh, they have to have the data published uh, on uh, magic before they will release the uh, paper that uh, we've worked with AGU and other journals to where that's not the case, but some editors and uh, people working at the journals aren't aware of that. So just let me know and we can work, work, work around that. Uh, we have an agreement with AGU that uh, as long as it's in the private workspace, that's fine. And then uh, when, the, when the paper's published, then uh, the data gets published afterwards. Um, just to let people know. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. I think Ken had his hand up uh, first. Uh, yeah, just um, really nice talk, Nick. Um, the uh, How do you deal with polarity? And I don't know about your other points, but the, the dike data you showed, do you just assume you, you didn't have multiple reversals? You just had one polarity, right? Yeah. Um, and how, I mean, are you just assuming everything's got to be in the same hemisphere so you can have collisions and amalgamation kind of thing yeah okay so you're just talking about in terms of whether whether it's northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere yeah, yeah. so i think with laurentia is a little bit unique in this regard given the richness of the database um so that it is sort of reasonable to make a continuous paleogeographic reconstruction with uh uh, consistent um, polarity. I think cratons through which there's more patchiness that becomes more difficult. Um, I think you can call that into question. Like for example, there's a canonical hemisphere of South China in the Neoproterozoic and there was uh, of it being in the Northern hemisphere and there was just a paper that came out that argued that instead you had large, uh, uh, large change from the Southern to Northern hemisphere. So I, I think you're certainly right that that is an ambiguity. Um, for Laurentia, there's a richness of the database where I think it's it's reasonable to follow the trail all the way back with a continuous paleogeographic model and to put it in the northern hemisphere in the way the way I did. Thank you, and it, Dario. Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the variable um, uh, continental uh, plate movement uh, from these new extracted from these new data. 
uh, are they like what are they and are they in any way comparable to the super fast plate motion that you've extracted from the Kinawinan track, for example? Yeah, so there does appear, um, and it's a bit model dependent, um, but in the uh, in the reconstruction I showed leading up to the trans-Hudson origin, um, you can take in the model that I showed, which is satisfying the poles, what is the velocity. Um, it's actually interestingly similar in terms of a sort of approaching around 20 centimeters per year. So it being similar to a sort of India approaching uh, Eurasia um, rate, which is, which is interesting sort of in the drive up, like the sort of lead up to a large scale mm -hmm. continent, continent uh, orogenesis and actually what ends up being kind of protracted continent, continent collision. Um, so certainly for most of the record of Laurentia, like that paleo latitude through time, mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not as rapid, it's more at sort of okay. characteristic plate, plate speeds, um, mm -hmm. but sort of at that time of trans-Hudson orogenesis, at the time of the leading up to the Grenville. And there's times in the Paleozoic where uh, Laurentia is reconstructed to be moving relatively rapidly as, as well. All right, thank you. Um, Lisa. Uh, I think you're muted. So th thanks for that. And I, I love the, um, you're pointing out, you don't have to have paleo intensity to show that there is probably a field you can use. Is there a pole? But you can go further than that, and it might be kind of fun. Ken Kadama and I, uh, you know, we worked on the Kiwanawan, and we compared the directions with those that you would expect from a TKO3 type secular variation model and showed that, yeah, they're consistent with that. And so it would be kind of fun to look at those, the data of your poles as they go to higher latitudes and different ages to look at the EI, the inclination elongation relationships, but you need a lot of data and probably we don't have, you don't have a hundred <laughs> sites at all those places, but, um, but that would be like a step further. And it wouldn't, it would just say, um, yeah, the field was there and the field was operating like it does now uh, or not, you know? So um, I, I just thought it'd be kind of fun yeah, no, I think that's a really uh, a really good point in terms of the sort of yeah richness that can be extracted. I think you're you're right in terms of uh, you know as you're well aware, and I know this because of your work. You know, quantifying the the shape of a distribution is much more difficult than quantifying its its mean mean position. Um, and there are like in this case, we're sort of excited, and it's more than usual to have you know around sort of. 23 VGPs, which would be enough to do that nicely. I, I also, I guess I have some concerns in some of these paleo-secular variation um, analyses on old, old rocks that sometimes have complicated histories in terms of the primary source of scatter being secular variation um, versus yeah. just a, a sort of inherent. And I know there's ways to, to deal with this, but it just becomes tricky given that most of our methods still revolve around taking things to be unit vectors and then looking at the shape of them, whereas the position of that unit vector has uncertainty. But however, that same assumption goes into making a pole. That's certainly true. It's just the it's just your uh, finding the mean of a distribution is is easier and takes lower end than the, the shape 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 of a distribution. Right? Yeah, it's a lot of work. The question is whether it's worth it. Yeah. But no, I, I think it's certainly. Um, yeah. And I, there has been some uh, there's, there's been some good, there is good, good work on, on this looking at, um, I, I don't know, it's, you know, it's more looking at the scatter parameter rather than going as a function of latitude, rather than full on going at the, the elong, uh, elongation inclination. Yeah, but the scatter parameter assume, assumes a Fisherian distribution, which may not be, well, but it's in the, yeah, it's more circular than Never mind. Whatever. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's all tricky. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Bram. Hi, Nick. Uh, thanks for your great talk. Um, I was wondering the the apparent polar wonder that you observe it may result in part from true polar wonder, right? Mm -hmm. So did you look into this, into the effects of true polar wonder, or do you just assume that it's zero? 
Yeah, so I think, I guess the place where I've looked into this the most is uh, relevant to that um, uh, Kiwanawan track. Um, and so that, 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 set, that set of poles. Um, and there, what you can do in trying to sort of fit the path um, as, uh, uh, is you can force it to be a great circle as it would be if it was solely to be explained through, through True Polar Wonder. Um, and I might actually here, I can just share, share, share screen quick. Um, so, so here is that, uh, that path, that path of poles that I was looking at and I showed an inversion of, and you, if you try to fit that with a single great circle, which would be true polar wonder, you don't achieve a good shape. So it's like, it requires some component of a small circle, not a great circle. Now it's very hard to, to, and this is just looking at one, one path. There's, you can also look at, there's also other evidence of, you know, looking, looking elsewhere on the globe and that uh, Kalahari, for example, didn't undergo the same rotation, but there certainly could be an element of true polar wander. So here's an inversion where we put in true polar wander and also a uh, small circle, so like a plate tectonic deferential plate motion rotation. Um, and if you do that, you can get, you can sort of put more of the motion into true polar wander if there's going to be less in, um, less, less in the, in the plate motion. Um, but I think that, anyway, that's, that, and that is, I mean, that was part of Stern's argument, right? Like you're definitely right that just changing pole position in and of itself um, doesn't, tell you uh, that if you're attributing that to true polar wander, it's not requiring uh, mobile lid plate tectonics. I think with the sort of yeah, exactly. disparate pole positions and then unification of the Archean provinces of Laurentia, that does require some uh, element of differential motion. And the shape of the path in this well-resolved part leading up to the Grenville orogeny, some of that could be driven by true polar wander, but I think there needs to be a significant plate, plate motion component as well. Okay, thank you.